right guys well here we are so here is the monument commemorating all of these brave Malaysian soldiers that fought in three wars three conflicts lost their lives on this side you can see their names this would be for World War One, of course. It's a place where people come to pay their deep respect. You know, like I said before, each life is just so precious. You know, it's uh, it is so grandiose when when somebody passes away, and uh, and so. Uh, each of these soldiers was each of the, uh, each death of each of these soldiers was a, a tragedy, and it's beautiful that there is a place here where people can come and remember their relatives and give them honor. Right here in the center of Kuala Lumpur. All right, guys. Well, there's the commemorative monument and. We're coming to the uh, famous bronze monument depicting these soldiers. It's done by the same guy that did the famous Iwo Jima monument in the United States. So it has a, a same feel to it, same energy. As you know, the flag of Malaysia has stripes, really similar to American flag, actually. From this side, when you walk up to it, for a second, you might almost think it's an American flag, but I assure you it's not. Yeah, as you can see, that's that's a flag of Malaysia. But look at this beautiful view. We're looking at the back of the soldiers. Here are the brave Malay soldiers in a moment of defense or perhaps attack. As you can see, there's two fallen ones on the ground, which appear to be, huh, one second. So let me tell you about a little bit about what you're seeing here. So you see the two soldiers that are laying down there appear to be deceased, killed, and these ones are the communist forces. Now, Malaysia had a, uh, a conflict with the communist insurgency post-World War II, and they were victorious. And, um, and this is sort of what this represents, the Malaysian army standing victoriously over the defeated communism. That's what this composition is symbolizing. And you can see it's dedicated to the heroic fighters and the cause of peace and freedom. So this one is not World War I or World War II. This is Malaysia's fight against communism post-World War II. And again, to give us a little bit better insight on what actually happened with this communist conflict post-World War II is banned. Okay, so here we have the main monument now. As you can see, it's very reminiscent of the American one we were discussing before. Part of the whole fight for freedom for Malaysia was also the Malayan emergency, which perhaps we don't talk about enough. But so what happened is the Communist Party started here, as in many places in the world, in sort of the early to mid-1930s. 
and then started up its own sort of army to try and take over the government. But what happened during the Japanese occupation is that the British authorities really helped out this Malaysian anti, or the People's Anti-Japanese Army, or some variation of those words, and um, it's sort of a guerrilla army to fight against the Japanese. And then once the war was over and the British tried to come back, many of those members who were either firmly communist or sort of communist throughout the war were now trained. So then a whole other movement started up. And in 1948, not long after the end of the war, they started attacking sort of uh, like police stations and British plantations and basically anything that they considered sort of... Um, well, the colonist presence. So this is, as I said, devoted to World War II, but sort of some of the same soldiers would have ended up fighting on both sides because the communist army kept growing. And then after that point, Malaysia had, had started its own army right during uh, during World War II. And so really the fallout of the war led to, which was basically a civil war, but they didn't want to call it that because if they call it that, then uh, all these British assets here wouldn't have been um, insured by London and by the British government. So it was an emergency. But his emergency lasted a long time. As you can see, you get up close, you can see the, the red star. Well, it's not red, but it would have been red star on one of the uh, hats of the uh, fallen communist soldiers, right? So there you go. You know, what's interesting about this one, and you don't see that very often, is usually, you know, it's just the monument. But here you have this a sort of dynamic part to it which is the flag that waves in the wind as you walk up here and sort of gives the whole composition this lively lively feeling like it's a feeling of action like they just they just got up the hill you know there's somebody's hosting up a wounded soldier somebody's calling uh, on the reinforcements or maybe you know saying something in jubilation and there's a flag waving like a wood at the time when it was happening. Now it's no accident that in 19, I think 1975, there was an incident where a, a sort of rogue communist guerrilla fighter, because uh, there's still there's still functions of them left even after the emergency was over. Uh, he came here and he he detonated a bomb, and uh, that has uh, damaged the the monument quite extensively. So they had to fix it up as I understand but that is why now you see there's a there's a border around the the park and I think it's supposed to close at 6 it's uh, 5 45 right now so we'll see if it actually closes down but um that sort of I was like why why was the communist trying to blow it up but now I see because there's literally dead communists in in the monument so that makes sense another thing is this place was where the prime minister of of, um, of of Malaysia come and and pay his respects during Warriors Day, which is um, for those of you that are watching from Canada or UK or or um, we, we call the Remembrance Day. Basically, it's a day of remembering all the soldiers that fought in all of the conflicts uh, in the past in the past uh, century and a half. So. So uh, this was the place where the prime minister would come and do, and do the, uh, the the commemoration. Um, unfortunately, since 2010, that has since stopped and has been moved to um, to Malacca, city of Malacca. And reason for that, um, the attitudes changed to art. Um, the the monument that you see behind me, um, it, it is now seen as um, um, as. Idolatrous, uh, because you know Malaysia is a Muslim country, so it is sort of seen a little bit improper to show pictures of um, sort of uh, the statues of people and, and sort of commemorate them. So, so since then, this place is not where the Warriors Day services happen. But you know that's there, that's fine, and uh, happens now in a different place, but. Just an interesting part of history I wanted to point out. So, you know, as we're walking out, there's a bridge that sort of leads you out of the memorial. And it's, it just made me think about something, you know, when you do a religious ritual, you know, there's 
usually three phases to it and it's been the same throughout human history and paganism and, and Christianity and the other religions but it's basically you know there's a first part kind of the introduction to the ritual so let's say for t for example let's take a part of a Christian mass right so you would sort of walk in the church sit down uh, sing uh, sing some religious songs you would um, pray but the focal point of the ritual is the mass right taking uh, the body of Christ and so that would be the focal point that's the second part that's the actual um, the, the climax of the ritual and then after that you sort of sit down and you sing a few more songs and you kind of start zoning out and 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 sort of by the time you walk out of the church you're you're back to your normal self right but the, the climax is always there and there's always a part that leads up to it and the part that leads from it and then you exit the ritual so same same with these things right it's um you know there's it's surrounded by water so this is the place of honoring the fallen so you know you sort of walk the park and you walk across the bridge and there's your climax and then you walk over the other bridge and you're done with your respect so it's just interesting how um these basic principles overlap over religious rituals and over places of paying respects right there's always this sort of like a triangle where you start you climax and then you and then you move out so it's an interesting connection i thought i would make looking at the outlay of of this monument anyway but um behind me is also a beautiful skyline of kuala lumpur and the building you see right there is the tallest building verisan Mardeka Tower, which is the tallest building in all of Asia. It is 629 meters tall, including that top, I believe. Uh, and uh, it is the second largest building in the world after Burj Khalifa in, in Dubai. So it's, it is a treat to look at, you know, it's, uh, it's just fascinating that it's just here. It's, uh, you know, I don't want to be offensive to me it kind of looks like a gigantic router or something uh, but you know it's pretty pretty amazing feat of design so yeah there you go and uh here's more of a skyline so yeah guys i'm glad we we had a chance to come here and visit together <coughs> look at the beautiful monument honor the the fallen soldiers honor their lives, honor their sacrifices, and be a part of Malaysian history. As you can see, there's a lot of people of Malaysian descent here, not just the tourists. So clearly this, this place is of a great significance to many, to many Malaysian people.